well. I want to invite you to this. So, uh, talk a little about Ed Sturick. Ed is a graduate 2002, although just a recent graduate, we like to say, from MIS program at, at Lamar University. He's done a remarkable thing. He started his company uh, about 50, uh, actually 20 years ago, almost 19 years ago, uh, AmeriCommerce. Have, who's heard about AmeriCommerce before? You people? Okay. By far one of the most successful software companies coming out of Vermont, Texas. Um, he uh, <coughs> incubated this program, uh, hired people, uh, MIS folks, computer science folks, and actually built the software juggernaut that we, it became, and eventually sold it to Capital One about uh, three or four years ago. And he has recently taken that uh, same idea out of Capital One and bought it back. And now he's developing that and growing the company once again uh, to its status. Uh, Ed is on my board, uh, the CIC advisory board. He's an entrepreneur, he's a technologist, and a really great guy, and uh, loves to wear plaid. And so I'm wearing plaid in honor for him. Uh, he's a really great guy. Looking forward to, to his presentation. So for no further ado, Ed Sturick, please. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ed. Um, I appreciate the plaid. Do you know what I'm wearing? She's got a plaid skirt too. You know, I, you know, I told everybody that uh, it actually multiplies in the closet. You know, plaid just has a has a way of being infectious like that. Um, I wanted to kind of start with just giving a view of our journey and how we approached uh, building our company and becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, my hope is to kind of incite that entrepreneurial passion uh, in in some of you. I think it's one of the greatest uh, uh, <coughs> trades that you can actually understand and know. Uh, being an entrepreneur is, is, is very difficult, but yes, very rewarding. Um, and those skill sets apply in no matter what job you're in, whether you are actually the business owner or you are in a large company of thousands and thousands of people. Those entrepreneurial skills actually stand out um, very well. So the more you can become entrepreneurial, the more you can learn those traits. Uh, I think the more uh, success you'll have in life. So, um, to kind of get things started, I want to get a few things out of the way. Um, I am a nerd. <laughs> I, uh, I I'm a geek. I love zombies. Um, you know, I love Marvel universe. I love the DC universe. I love it all. You know, um, I love cars and I love technology. I, uh, I'm also a platter, you know, I love, <laughs> I love plaid. It's one of those things that is uh, very underrated. Anybody wearing plaid right now? Anybody have anything plaid on one? Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't want to raise his hand. <laughs> I appreciate all of you wearing plaid. Um, you know, a platter, like a totally made up term. Um, I actually, uh, I, I looked it up on Urban Dictionary thinking like, I wonder if this is going to be a bad thing. I mean, let me look it up. On urban dictionary first, it's actually not there, so we're going to claim that. You know, so we're actually going to have our own uh, term coming out of this. I think. Um, you know, uh, plaid. I you know, I'll, I'll try to draw some actual meaning into plaid that really isn't there. You know, but basically, it's a uh, it's a mix of some really strong colors. You know, like you bring those colors together, um, and it makes it look really good. You know, good happen. It makes us look all all a little bit better. Um, I. Uh, Look, I, I don't want. I, I I've been wearing plaid since I was a kid. You know, like this is before like urban lumberjack. You know, this is before uh, the the '90s grunge era and all the flannels. You know, like we we've been, I've been wearing plaid since I was a kid. Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to lie. That's because I'm lazy, right? Like <laughs> a lot of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs get up and they they run companies, they build companies, and they. Uh, they look like they're Superman, you know, a lot of times. You watch these videos and they're just like, it, it feels like they're, they're always on and they have all these skills and passion. And you're like, I wonder how I could ever actually do that. Like, they almost seem surreal or superhuman. <coughs> um, that is not the case. Most entrepreneurs have plenty of faults. Um, they're lazy. They have bad attitudes. They, uh, um, they wake up late. They get up way too early. They don't spend enough time kids, like there's all kinds of problems, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, but there's also all these rewards, and I think that's what everybody sees and is glamorized in the media, is, is all the rewards that happen from entrepreneurialism and running a company. Um, but it doesn't take a superman uh, to do that. You know, like if they, 
If there was a bad tattoo, I would get one. You know? <laughs> I haven't seen one that looks good, but uh, I've actually got one. I, uh, I also love our area. You know, uh, Lamar's here. You know, Lamar's a gem of our area. Lamar's sitting here changing lives uh, daily. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we have a lot of good things coming out of Lamar. You know, we kind of mentioned the, the CICE earlier. Um, that, is, that is inspiring entrepreneurialism inside of, inside of our student base. Um, you know, Paul is doing a great job over there. He, he basically built a startup inside of Lamar. That's one thing that isn't quite understood. Um, that, and he made this out of nothing. It wasn't there. It was just an idea. He got grants for it. He got it funded. He built it. He built a building on Lamar that rivals any of the best buildings here. Uh, and all of that happened just through that same entrepreneurial spirit. So I love our area. You know, I love, I love Southeast Texas. It's kind of not, not too big. It's not too small. It's big enough for, uh, for industry. Um, it's big enough for a technology startup. I think it was it was hard to build one here, you know, early in the the, the time when we were starting, 2002 to 2005. Um, but it was uh, it was completely doable, and uh, we 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 love the area. I'm also an investor. I like to grow things. Um, uh, I live and breathe small business. Um, I help a lot of small businesses build their journey online. Um, through AmeriCommerce, uh, and we also uh, have recently started picking up some other companies in ShareBuilder 401k as well. <coughs> and we help small businesses actually produce a 401k plan for their for their associates. Or if you're even just a one-person company, we can actually uh, set up a 401k plan that gives you tax benefits, tax deferrals, etc. Um, just like a large company's 401k plan. And we do it on the cheap. A lot of uh, big companies, they, they charge you know, 1 to 2 percent of your money. Um, we charge just a very small fraction of that. Um, to, the mission is to help people save, help America save. And so how are we going to do that? And, and, and ShareBuilder is the way we can do that. Um, so investing <coughs> is one of the things that uh, I'm starting to grow and have, have more of a passion for myself. I'm also a builder. I create things. I uh, have lots of help doing that. I do not do it. I'm not a superman. Um, yeah, I, I, I come from a coding background. Um, I, I did build a lot of the early code for our product. Um, but I also did it with a team. I did it with, uh, I did it with people that, that dedicated themselves to the vision that we created. Um, and definitely did not do it alone. I, uh, The primary thing that that I have built in my in my journey is AmeriCommerce. Um, you know, we did it with a team of people. Uh, we we help people sell stuff online. That's what AmeriCommerce does. AmeriCommerce allows you to list your products um, on a web page and, and and sell those products to consumers, produce the tracking number for the order, um, and actually see that uh, that tracked shipment get all the way to the customer. Take the payment. Uh, it's the full life cycle journey of, the, of an online store. Um, you know, we 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 are their storefront on the web, basically. Uh, that's the primary thing that 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 that, that I have built. We have a lot of trusted names, a lot of <coughs> a lot of logos of large businesses that people know and love. Um, I will admit that. Uh, I know many of you won't, uh, but I was, I, I liked to yo-yo when I was a kid. <laughs> um, I, I thought I was the uh, Peyton Manning of yo-yoing. Um, I, I was not very good at that though. Uh, I could barely walk the dog, but I thought I was the king. Um, and now we actually run yo-yo.com. It's pretty neat to actually see that uh, come full circle. And as AmeriCommerce has grown. We've done pretty well. Um, we have over $6 billion in transactions and growing. Um, we have 9 million products uh, listed through our various websites. Um, and we run about 3,000 stores um, and continuing to add more and more every day. Uh, we have hundreds of e-commerce features. We're kind of the Photoshop of, of the e-commerce world. There, there are simpler versions out there, but we have a very business-to-business -business focus of our product. Um, we have merchants in dozens of countries all over the world. Um, 
and then we have hundreds of third-party applications that are kind of integrated in with us through our API and um, through our product uh, development cycle. I want to try to bring everybody through um, some little things that I've learned along the way of building Amira Commerce. Um, I, uh, you know, it was 3 a.m. last night, I was throwing this deck together. So I was like, hey, I got I like it. Um, so these are like little entrepreneurial uh, um, nuggets of wisdom that, that, that I've learned over time that have helped us. Inter intermingled in this will be the journey of America like how we got started um, and how some of these wisdom, wisdomisms were I created, uh, how that actually relates to the journey that, that, that we've done. So anyone can be an entrepreneur. Uh, it doesn't matter your background. Um, it doesn't matter your, your socioeconomic status, your, your, your race, your religion. Nothing, nothing matters. Anybody can become an entrepreneur. We came from, uh, the, the, my partners and I, we didn't come from uh, a background of, of money. We had good parents, we had good teaching, um, and we just had a uh, passion. And so anybody can become that entrepreneur. So don't, uh, if you have an idea, you have a problem to solve, dive in and give it a go. One of the biggest lessons that we've learned along the way, and you probably see this a lot, um, it, it's, it's actually becoming mainstream and I'm glad, uh, but basically you try, you test, you fail a lot of times and you learn from that failure. You actually then repeat that process. Um, sometimes you feel like that uh, uh, person in the bottom left there. Um, you're, you're, you're barely just lifting up from the ground, you're dragging on, but you're not going to die, you're just going to keep going um, until you completely fail, which is completely okay. Um, or until you actually succeed. Uh, in 2005, technically 2002, but, but we actually kicked off the actual company um, documents and such in, in 2005. Uh, we, we kicked off AmeriCommerce. Uh, we were just two nerds, kind of got together with the bald salesman. Uh, we walked into an old metal building in downtown, in, in over near Cardinal Drive, really. Um, we stared deeply at each other's code, um, and we decided that you know we are we are destined to be together. Um, we're like peanut butter and jelly in a lot of ways. The the, the founders that that <coughs> get together to build AmeriCommerce. Um, my app that I was creating, I was already trying to sell stuff online by that point. Um, I was creating a, a T-shirt and, and, and a hat and embroidery and screen printing store online. And so my app was architected very well. You know, I'm more of a software architect background. And so it was very architected very well. And it was ugly as sin. Uh, it was just so, it was, it was so visually unappealing that I'm embarrassed to this day. Um, you know, I walked in and uh, I met Stefan. Uh, and his, he was building an e-commerce application as well. His application was beautiful. Um, it looked great, it had all these features. I started diving in, the buttons didn't work. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the code was very dirty, you know, like it was fast, it was thrown up, but he had the, the ability to kind of see and throw things together very quickly to test it and to learn from that test. Are people actually going to use this? Did they click the button that didn't work? Who knows, you know? Um, you, you marry those two personalities and, and we actually kind of walk the middle ground of each other very well. We, 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 we balanced each other out in a lot of ways. And uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie, the other partner that came together was, uh, you know, a salesman, true and true. You know, he knew how to take that peanut butter and jelly and, and actually, you know, he was the ball of white bread around it, you know. <laughs> he, uh, he knew how to sell it. He knew how to convince people that that's what they needed was peanut butter and jelly. Uh, this was before the carp craze, you know. We, um, we built fun and hard working culture. Uh, we brought a lot of people together, different, um, a lot of different people, a lot of different skill sets. We brought them together. Uh, we grew the company. Uh, we grew a lot of beards. 
<laughs> a beard was by a requirement. So if you didn't have a beard, you had to sign on that you were going to have a beard. Um, and then you can always get the fake beard. And, you know, if you're a girl, you can always buy a beard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, uh, that, that I believe in is, is building a mishmash of people. Um, taking people, mashing them together, uh, backgrounds, different different cultures, different viewpoints, um, uh, every all of that comes together in a really interesting way. What you want to do is hire where you suck. Like if you're bad at something, you know, don't be threatened by somebody who's better than you at something. You want to actually hire the person that can compliment you in a lot of ways. Just like our founding partners, we all compliment each other. So hire where you suck. Um, we come together, you know, I say it's a plaid company, we come together to make people uh, um, look better, you know, like you, you're actually coming together and you are building a company that you couldn't build yourself, you couldn't do this by yourself. You wear many hats as an entrepreneur, uh, I don't know if anybody knows limiting snippets, but, uh, but you, 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 early on, like, we had to do everything ourselves, we had to uh, become different people in a lot of ways. Uh, funny story is that early on we were just there was just four of us. Um, you know, Charlie was 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 selling. Stefan and I were building. Um, we had Dustin in the back building as well. You know, he was uh, he was the the young software architect that that, that you know grew into a, an incredible one. And Stefan and I were kind of on the front lines. We built. We managed customer questions. Um, we did just about everything at the company. And so we realized pretty early on that we couldn't do it all. Um, and that if people got our contact information, we got bogged down very, very heavily. Um, so, so we weren't scared to talk to people, but it just flooded in. So we're, how, how can we potentially do that when we're having our support hat on, when we're, we're managing customers or we're selling to them? How can we actually do that? Well, enter Frank and George. Frank? was Stefan, George was me. Um, we actually made up a name, I know, <laughs> traveling that gray area here, um, but what we did was we made up a name, we made up, made, made up a persona, because we needed to appear bigger than we were, and we needed to kind of separate some of those concerns, so we created Frank and George. Um, had little profile pics and everything. Uh, and we gave the customers support from founders, though, uh, but with a little bit of protection for as, as, as you know, humans behind the scenes trying to, to build the company out of nothing. So. You have to learn to wear a lot of hats and you have to do so to keep moving fast. Um, we built a culture of goofballs. Uh, this was our early offices. Uh, we moved from the metal warehouse over to um, a little bit better office over on Calder. Uh, we you know, we're all winners, so uh, see a little bit of uh, some of our Nerf guns, um, you know, required attire for, for work, suit and tie only. <laughs> Up there in the top left, his name's Mike, uh, he went on vacation for a week, and so we were bored. Uh, we actually foil wrapped his entire <coughs> desk down to the pennies and quarters that were on the desk. We actually foil wrapped those as well, um, and then we made him work through the foil. <laughs> Uh, we had a 30-foot poster of the Flash in our in our support area, um, and we like to play pranks, pranks on each other. You know, like they held a kitty in my office one day. Um, I thought that would be interesting when I walked in. I moved all the cardboard cutouts from the entire office in, put Hello Kitties on all monitors, all surfaces. If it had a surface, it had a Hello Kitty on it. We have learned that a little bit of quirky can bring a lot of happiness. Um, a little bit of goofing off can create and encourage creativity. Um, it encourages <coughs> the ability to talk to each other. Um, and one of the things that we like the most is spirited debate. You know, I don't want to say argument, but there's been plenty of arguments that have come out of the spirit of debate. Um, however, we all got smarter from that. Uh, that debate and that ability to talk to each other and to question management, to question the CEO, to question um, the, the VPs of the company, 
uh, if you don't, you actually kind of don't make it as a Maricomers. And, and I think that that's a good thing. Uh, you want to be able to have anybody talk to anybody in the company about anything. Um, and you want to be real. You really want to keep it real. So we, we built the company um, via having a vision. Uh, yeah, this is vision from the world. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he knows all my references. Uh, so, you know, Vision knows where he's going. Uh, he knows what's up. You know, he's, uh, he's got a method um, to his madness, but we need a method of how to get there ourselves. Um, and this is entering into some of those core business tenets of you have a vision. A vision is kind of like a lofty <coughs> goal that you've set forth. It's the stake in the ground. It's something that doesn't change over the 10-year cycle of your company. Um, you know, you may morph it just a little bit, but your vision is typically something that you're actually trying to accomplish, and you're going to keep building products and, and things towards that vision. Um, your mission, a lot of times I say mission is kind of like a yearly thing, uh, maybe a multi-year thing. Uh, it's something that tells you how to ladder up to your vision. Um, you take your mission and you turn your mission into goals and strategic objectives, things that allow you to uh, live out the mission itself. And so with those goals, you have impact areas, organizational structure. You all ladder all of that stuff up to the vision and the mission of the company. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to pick your vision. And it's hard to pick your vision, I mean your mission. Uh, but you, you put it on paper. You put the stake in the ground. And you try to live that out. And you kind of bury that with your core beliefs or your core tenets of how you operate. And so you'll kind of see a little bit of that in here of, of things that allowed us to become uh, kind of who we were, you know, and what, what, kind of, what kind of drive and spirit did we want to instill in our people. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of that through, through here. One really great way that I've learned over the years to, to ladder things up to a vision um, is all the way down here at the projects and the actions area. You want to actually make sure that it's impact what you're building and what you're doing. There's a million things you can do in a day. You want to actually try to actually pick the right things, and that's probably the hardest thing you can actually do. Uh, my task list is, you know, pages and pages long. How do I make sense of that? I can't even read it from top to bottom in a few hours. You know, how do I actually make sense of that? So what we do is we, we, rate, them. we rate each thing. We grade them, basically. So each idea, each task gets an effort point and an impact point. And so if it's an effort of, say, two, that means it's going to take roughly two days to do. Um, if it's an effort like five, that's five days. An effort 0.25 is 0.25 days, so a quarter of a day. Um, this is an ideal working day for an associate of the company. So we, we say, okay, we think this is going to be like two-day thing. And then we say, okay, well, the impact. <coughs> what, how, how much impact does this task have? Very simple. It's plus plus. This is something you can do in notepad. Um, you don't actually have to have some big task management system. You don't have to have anything other than your phone or some note-taking app on your computer. Uh, and so you actually add a plus-plus if it's really good, maybe three pluses or four pluses if it's incredibly good. So if it's very impactful, you give it pluses. If it's not all that impactful, you give it a minus. Maybe it's not all that impactful right now, you give it a minus-minus. Um, and you can actually look at this list at a glance, look for your pluses, and look for your low effort wins, so the E2s of the world. Uh, if you can cross those off very quickly, you're actually going to completely take that thing off the list. If you see an E30 on there, you know that that task is too big. Um, you know that that task is going to, you need to break that task down into smaller tasks for one. Um, and you need to absolutely make sure an E30 task is very core to your vision or mission. Otherwise, you're spinning your wheels, you're wasting your time. So that's one little little technique that I've picked up over the years to kind of bring everything back to the vision of the mission that you set. Building a company is, you hear a lot of different things. You hear about funding a lot. You get picked up $5 million, $10 million, $100 million to build this. You know, It's a billion dollar company valuation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, funding is one of the least 
known factors of success. They are, they, that is not going to guarantee you anything. It, it isn't core to your success. A lot of people, may included, would have thought the idea, like that was the thing that actually mattered, right? Early on, I really thought the idea was the most important thing. Um, the problem is, is ideas are, ideas are cheap, you know? Um, everybody has them. How many times has somebody said, you know what, I could have built that, or I thought of that years ago, you know? Um, I'm sure that some of you have had that moment. Uh, Pinterest is a great example. We all think we built Pinterest years ago, you know? Like, oh, I could have done that, you know? It's just like some pictures, you just mash them together. Um, but what is super interesting is across hundreds and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of companies is the thing that mattered most for the success of those companies was timing. Being at the right place at the right time, that serendipitous moment where you wanted to create something and people actually wanted to buy what you created. They wanted what you created. So that timing is most important. Uh -oh. She's mad at me. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is the team and the execution. The people that you put behind your idea, your vision, your mission, the team has to jive. It has to be able to execute. You know, we can all be friends and family, um, but if we're sitting around talking, we're not doing, we're not crossing off action items, we're not, um, we're not uh, uh, producing the impact that we hoped we would, then we're going to die. You know? And so that team, the right people at the right time, coming together to execute. Those are the top two things that matter the most. And then after that, obviously the idea um, and the business model, obviously, are fast followers behind those two. So. so remember, funding matters the least here. You have a good idea, you produce a proof of concept of that idea, you put it in front of people. If it's a good idea, somebody will invest in that. Money is a free flowing thing in today's economy um, for good ideas. And so if you can just package that idea up, people will invest in that idea. I'll give it a shot. So 2014, so 2005, all the way, nine years, uh, we were done. We, we sold to <coughs> uh, a huge moment for us. We, we, we built the company with, I think we were around 30 people at the time. Um, you know, we... We were so excited. It was, it was timing. Timing timing was very much on our side. Uh, people were trying to go online uh, very aggressively around uh, a couple of years before this and through this time. And we had we had incredible companies calling on us. Uh, MasterCard actually looked at acquiring us. Um, there was a company, a lot of people don't know it, but it's First Data. It's a very large company. Um, that does a lot of credit card processing for banks. So they, they run all the Bank of Americas and, and uh, um, some other large banks in credit card processing. They do it all. Um, and they have a lot of products kind of under their belt. And so they're this conglomerate, um, and they came calling. And then Capital One came calling. You know, we, uh, we, we loved it all. And we were going to New York, you know, we were, we were uh, up in boardrooms at the top of these huge buildings, we're looking right over, um, right over the city, over the, uh, over the memorial, etc. Uh, the CEO of First Data, uh, interesting guy, you know, he he very passionate. Um, um, from New Jersey, he, you know, he actually held a credit card machine up in his hand, and he said, "You know what, Ed? What do you see here? What do you see, huh?" huh? And uh, I'm trying to answer him, and he's just continuing to talk, you know. <laughs> I see a dinosaur. That's what I see. And he takes this credit card machine, and he slams it against the wall. And we're like, oh, my goodness, what is going on here? Like, he just missed the window like, this much, you know. We're in this story of this uh, huge building. Uh, like, what's going to happen? You know? um, but that kind of passion, it was, it was, it was pretty infectious, you know. Uh, Capital One came in, though. You know, they were coming in with, this vision of bringing small business together. Like, we're going to actually help people start their small business by giving them a bank account. <laughs> Pretty trivial, right? Uh, what we learned at Capital One was buying a bank account is like, is like parking in a parking lot. You just pick, <coughs> you pick the one closest to you. Um, and so that wasn't a compelling argument for a small business to choose Capital One. So the vision that we were uh, hearing from Capital One was 
let's bring some products together, like the people that make your website, the people that charge your credit card, the process the credit card. Um, so the credit card machines, they, we had a little swiper, it was called SparkPay, that, uh, that you swiped your credit card in, very much like Square today. Um, and so bring all this stuff together, give them some marketing support, give them uh, apps that help them with their company documents, et cetera, et cetera. Build this startup little ecosystem, and then with one little package, one fee, bam, you can get started. Great vision. We loved it. Like this was who we were talking to. We love small businesses. Uh, we loved uh, we loved the ability to help people realize their dreams. And so Capital One came in, and plus they're all like fist bumps, and you know we were drinking the Kool Aid. And, you know they everybody else was just like their their hands were kind of like oh we're gonna do great things together. Their hands were together and they you know clasp over their chest. We're gonna do great things together. Um, you know, Capital One was fist bumps and smiles and laughs, and uh, they lo they loved our culture and we loved what they were trying to build. So we took the dive. It was uh, it was scary. You know, we got the offer. We're like, all right, this is going to work. You know, a little bit of back and forth negotiation. Everybody said yes. All right. So now it's time to actually go through uh, what's called diligence, which is the building of. Uh, the documents and proving that you are who you say you are, you know. Capital One wants to make sure that your company is real, that you're not going to just walk away. Um, so all of this diligence uh, is done to to protect Capital One and to protect us. Are we buying into the vision that we really thought we are? Can Capital One deliver? Are they going to actually invest in us? Uh, what I cared about was the 30 people behind me, you know, that were that were trying to build this company that built it with me, you know, they, that's who I cared about. Um, we also had investors, I cared about them too. It was a fine balance sometimes because you actually had to sometimes not give the investors what they wanted in order to give your associates what they wanted. Um, raises, right, like uh, the ability to uh, have flexibility at work, um, to build new things. Those are things that sometimes investors don't really want you to do. They want you to just kind of stay the course and just do what you can do, cut costs where you can, uh, produce as much uh, payout as possible. You know, that fiduciary duty is something that you have to take seriously as a CEO. But however, the things that matter is the people building, the people that is behind you on the uh, in the company. That's what matters. So you had to have this balance. And what I loved about Capital One was they saw that. Um, we pulled a great package together that um, was great for the investors, you know, myself and, and, and everybody that was on the investment side. But for those of us that were not investors, Capital One said, hey, we're going to have this whole pool. Uh, we're going to be able to give everybody raises. So it's like Christmas, you know. It's like, you get a raise and you get a raise. Everybody gets a raise, you know. Um, it, was, it was good. It was exciting. It was a very exciting time. That diligence was very difficult. It took months. Um, we were very close to that. And uh, we, we were, I knew, I knew I was stressed because it's like 2 a.m. I'm, I'm, I'm filling out forms um, and I'm just like, I'm tired. So I find myself on the floor with a tablespoon. I like a little spoon, like a big tablespoon and a jar of peanut butter. Uh, I'm eating peanut butter on the floor, 2 a.m. in the morning, filling out documents. Yeah, low point. Um, I love peanut butter though. This is so good. Uh, but the the ability to kind of manage that stress was was very difficult. And then I got a call. Uh, my my uh, my mother was on the line. Um, she said, "Your dad he has stopped breathing." Um, so I rush over there. Um, we do our best. Uh, we lose my dad. It was at this apex moment of my career, I lose my father. My father was an investor in the company. He, he taught me a lot of what I knew and loved about life, and he's gone. Um, very difficult moment for me professionally, hardest time in my life, end of story. Um, I had to remember that there's that tragedy, but there's also 30 people counting on me to actually do something incredible for them. Um, and what I had to be able to do is put on the right, the strong face. Um, uh, it was difficult to talk about at the time, so I just kind of pushed it kind of aside. You know, my father taught me to uh, live life, you know. Uh, you know, 
my dad smoked pot every day. My whole life. <laughs> um, I didn't realize this until I was like 16 or 17. It took me that long to figure out what that smell was. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he, he, he had friends, you know, like we packed the funeral hall. Like there was just so many people from all walks of life from growing up. He had his hunting buddies. Uh, he was a historical shootist. Uh, he was the president of a shootist club. All of his buddy, shooter buddies were there. Uh, his buddies out at Mobile where he worked. Um, his, uh, he was an entrepreneur himself. He left Mobile. He started a, he started a screen print and embroidery company here in town called Jimmy Prince. Uh, all of this stuff is things that him and my mother kind of taught me. And so I had to hold all of this together. He knew how to get things done. My mom knew how to get things done. He was always the kind of the, the he was a little grumpy, but, but he was, uh, he would always say, things will just work out, Ed. Things will work out. It work. Mom's in the background rolling her eyes because she's the one that made things work out, right? <laughs> My mom was the type A personality. Uh, she was the one that, that when it wasn't getting done, she would get somebody to do it. She made it happen. And so, again, they were a good mix of two people, uh, very different people um, coming together to actually build the company themselves um, and, and do some amazing things. They taught me that. So at this hard moment of my life, uh, we actually closed the deal successfully. Um, everybody was happy. And so what I learned through that was perseverance, you know, some, some things you might think are obvious, but, um, you know, I kind of call it the drumbeat of success. Uh, a drummer is, 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 is a thing that, whether you're in a band or whether you're on a, field, a battlefield, a drummer is setting the pace for those around you. Um, and one of the things that they do is make sure that soldiers put one foot in front of the other. Um, you're always moving forward. Um, you're never looking back. So. You know, something that I learned through that was just keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep trying, keep doing, and you'll you'll deliver on what you uh, what you're supposed to. So in 2015, exciting times. Capital One, we're part of Capital One. 44,000 people worked at Capital One. Uh, overwhelmingly large number of people there. Um, we had the ability to build a new office here in town, in Beaumont, top of Edison Plaza. Uh, the big white building in downtown Beaumont. Um, we built this really cool office. Uh, they gave me the ability to do whatever I wanted. You know, like build it how I wanted to build it. Um, so to stay true to our culture, we had games. We had Mario Kart, Operation Ghost, or have Mario Kart, Operation Ghost. Ping pong has always been uh, a violent uh, part of our history in our company. Um, ping pong, we added some foosball. Uh, so we have this whole like social zone at the top of Edison Plaza looking down over all of Beaumont. It's gorgeous. Uh, we, I was able to design that um, and, and work through all the challenges of building something new. Let's build an office, you know. It's not just software anymore. It's not just a company. Now it's like, let's build an office that you have always wanted. Uh, I, I grew up watching Big. I'm probably too old of a reference, but it's like this, he's Tom Hanks, he's a, he's a, he's a, He's a kid, he gets body swapped, or he basically ages overnight um, into a 35-year-old man. Um, and all he wants to do is play. He's like a 10-year-old kid at heart. So he wants to play, so he goes into a toy company. He dances on some pianos, he builds toys. It's all amazing. And I watched that kid grow, I mean, I watched that as a kid growing up, saying, I want to build a company like that right there. That's the kind of company I want to build. Um, and that's what we did. It's great. We. We, we named stuff in the office around like, pirate pop culture was our, was our terminology in the office. Like we had, you know, King's Landing for, for that, you know, Game of Thrones reference. It had uh, Dread Pirate Roberts from the Princess Bride <laughs> in one of the conference rooms. We had uh, The Cave from the Goonies uh, is one. <coughs> the Inferno from the Princess Bride again. Never Never Land from uh, Peter Pan and Hook. Um, like we had all of these things uh, kind of like permeating the office because it's again who we were. Thank you. 
company, Capital One, uh, they, they are dispersed all over the U.S., you know, and so we <coughs> saw that we could build things and we could do things very quickly. We had this amazing system of productivity. Um, our people were on fire, you know. Um, they wanted to actually teach the rest of the company how to do that, you know. So they see something good in you and they want to be able to use that to, to, to uh, infect their culture with the same thing. That's part of why they acquired us, you know. So, we were able to actually build a whole new team of people. Um, you know, they, they, I inherited a number of, of, of teams of people from San Francisco to, to DC. Um, we built new products. Uh, we had the SparkPay uh, reader. Uh, we were growing that hand, you know, uh, very, very, very quickly. Uh, we grew people, you know, like we grew, I learned a lot at Capital One. I kind of knew how to grow people for what I needed them to do. Um, at Capital One, I learned how to grow people for what they wanted to do. You know, like they have a mission and a vision for their own lives. You know, um, and that's something that doesn't always align with your 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 vision as a as a company or as a CEO. Um, and so I learned how to cultivate a, a broader culture, a lot of different locations, a lot of people. Um, that was something that only Capital One could have ever provided me. Um, we. We built some pretty cool products. Capital One. This may not. This is some, uh, some people that we have to work with. This is all an internal commercial that we created on our team. Okay, you're welcome to the shopping. I started to notice that the 
uh, my time was just spent going across the country, talking to people, um, trying to, to build these products. Um, and I was in meeting after meeting, so was my associate. Like everybody was in meetings all the time. You know, it was something that I learned about myself professionally that, you know, I'm 40 and I'm actually starting to learn actually who I am at this point. I'm gone from home too much, you know, I travel, I tried to set boundaries, I said, said a week a month, you know, that, that didn't seem unreasonable. Well, that week turned into usually about two weeks a month to have that boundary. So, you know, I was traveling about half the time. I'm um, still manageable, uh, fun for, for a while, um, but I, I just learned that what I cared about was my local community more. Um, I, my, my friends, my family, I wanted to be there, I wanted to actually build something here in Beaumont. Um, I, I started to learn that I hated too many meetings. I couldn't build anything if I'm in meetings all the time. Um, and you know, there's status meetings. There's meetings to actually talk about other meetings that need to be created. You know, there were actually meetings about those. We had a whole series of meetings called Bust the Goo to get rid of meetings. So we had meetings to get rid of meetings um, and varying levels of success across the organization. Uh, it's such a huge organization that you need meetings in a company that big. I get that. Um, I just learned it wasn't for me. I liked a smaller company. I loved it. You know, I, I built, have built products for small businesses. I've had small businesses. I wanted to actually be able to do that. Um, you know, to me, death of meetings. More than one meeting a week, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you know, unless it's with a customer, like you, you can't avoid meetings with it as a salesperson. There's certain roles where you can't necessarily avoid meetings. Um, but I'm talking the status meetings, the uh, what are you building, what are you doing type meetings. I have learned that. Uh, we wanted to spin off back again through that process. Uh, I wanted to be, I wanted to be local again, and I wanted to uh, be here uh, for for my family. So I kind of floated the idea: what if we bought the company back to Capital One? And uh, they did. So I think it was uh, great. In 2017, a couple of years ago, we spun back off. Um, never has happened in the corporate history of Capital One ever. You know, they didn't even know how to do it necessarily. Uh, we were all up for the challenge. That's one good thing about Capital One is that they liked the entrepreneurial spirit and they wanted to be able to help us by spinning back off. Um, so they, they were up for the task and so were we. Uh, it was harder than we thought, that's for sure. Second hardest time of my life through this process right here. Um, and I'm not just talking professionally, like these are the two hardest moments of my life, being acquired and then, and then buying it back. Uh, very difficult times. Um, during this time, uh, my mother's store, you know, my father had passed, and, and the, the business that we created growing up, um, you know, like it was too much for her. She's getting older, like I had to say, Mom, it's time to retire. She didn't want to do that, you know. It took a few months for her to finally realize through her health and things that, you know, you can only be a hard-working entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, you know, you're in your 60s, you know, at that point you need to kind of slow down a little bit. Um, so mom, please, retire. All this is happening at the same time we're spinning out of Capital One. Her health was taking a nose down. I knew this was the only moment that we could do this. Um, so we signed up to not only buy our company back from Capital One, but to kind of like rip apart this company that we have built our whole lives through my parents, you know. Rip that apart, sell off the pieces, uh, convince mom to retire, make her okay with that. Um, all this kind of happening at the same time. So we, <coughs> we did that, it was a good thing though. We acquired ourselves back. And in 2018, we spent all of that year kind of getting our groove back. We started talking to customers again. One of the most important things you can do as a business. We had lost sight of that a little bit at Capital One. Uh, we kind of did a lot of stuff that Capital One and us, we wanted to do as Capital One. We spent so much time on internal stuff that we that we lost track of our customers. We lost track of uh, the conversations that got us where we are. Um, and so we started building again what they needed. We decided that that the customers and what they wanted was the most important thing. Um, we basically looked inward at our systems. You know, we're, our internal systems were frayed around the edges. We had never quite got around to automating some things, so we, we took the whole year. We automated all of the drudgery processes. Um, we got our groove back, and we started building again. That was, uh, that was home for us, building, building a product, building who we are. We learned a few things through that. Um, customers need you. They really, really need you. You live or die by your customers. 
Um, you have to get to know them. This is what we did in the early version of AmeriCommerce. In this AmeriCommerce 2, <coughs> we come back, back to those same roots. Uh, you know, if you know your customers, you can help them. And by helping them, they're helping you. So how do you do that tactically? Something you don't hear in a lot of these talks is like tactically, how do you do that? Just like the effort and the reward system, um, the effort, impact, and, and, and result system that we talked about earlier, you need feedback forms, phone support, um, some of those different things. Feedback forms, just like a place to go online to where your customers can actually have a conversation with you and tell you what they want out of your business. Um, and then you try to grade that and try to ladder that up to your vision. And if it fits, do it. Do it for them. You know, like that's what they're wanting. And they can actually kind of help you navigate your product roadmap and your company roadmap. Um, your customers will love you for it. Happiness, again, through that journey, I learned like what makes me happy, you know, and I started reading a little bit more about happiness, you know, getting a little older, like, how, you know, how do you actually be happy in life, you know? Like, at this point, uh, you know, everybody talks about money and some of those kinds of things, you know, like, oh, it would just change my world if, if, if just money wasn't quite so tight, you know? Um, and I was a big believer in that, you know, I chased money my whole life, you know? and. Uh, as I learned more and more that money didn't really solve very many problems, it you know, got, us, got us a little further down the road, but, but it didn't really solve all that many problems. You still have a lot of those same core things. So you read about happiness. What really drives happiness? Friends, family, community, giving back. Those things are things that actually drive happiness. This isn't, this isn't just me saying it. Like This is plenty of studies drive this exact same result. Um, the experiences that you live and you learn, the teaching that you get and the, the learning that you get um, actually drive happiness. So continue learning, feeding yourself just every day. Um, and purpose. Purpose, one of the hardest things to actually nail down for you personally. Uh, purpose changes over time, uh, but it's something that uh, is core to happiness. So, what drives you, knowing what that is, and building your own personal vision and mission to get there. Uh, very important. It's not just a career thing. Purpose might be serving. Purpose might be uh, giving back. It might be a number of different things. It doesn't have to be a career thing. But finding your purpose is core to happiness. Um, so I kind of learned through through that cycle uh, of the journey what, what drove me to be happy. Local, um, not necessarily being in front of you know the country and trying to do something uh, build this empire, uh, that, that really wasn't, that's what I did my whole life, and that's not really what was, uh, what was driving my happiness. So in 2019, we, uh, here we are, um, we are now uh, building a, I, I wanted to go back to the community, we love downtown Beaumont, how can we do that? Well, we can actually have our own office. Um, uh, we, we don't have to lease from somebody, you know, we, it's time to actually build a building now, so, um, you know, build built a product, built a company, built a, uh, an, an exit, built an office. Now it's time to actually build a building for the office for us to live in. Uh, we wanted to kind of get back to downtown Beaumont. Over there on the left is uh, one of the partners. He started this project. He kind of saw the, saw, saw the building for what it was in 2008 or so. Um, and so he kind of started some of the renovations and, and we've kind of picked it up from there uh, here recently just in, over the last year. And so in the middle is kind of where we are when we kind of, uh, uh, a few months in, uh, we had all these cool like exposed brick walls on the ins inside of the office. It's 20 foot ceilings. It's really, it's gonna be really cool. Um, the next thing was build a, build a building in 3D. You know, like we needed to, I, I realized that it was really hard to plan a space without, um, without you know, architects and designers and stuff like drawing everything up for you, so we decided to draw it up ourselves. Do our, does our furniture fit? Um, where will it go? You know, let's move everything around. Um, let's build the space that we want on this next round of, uh, round of the company. So we're in the midst of this building right now. Um, now we're having to build it for real. We're in the construction phase right now. There's like nails, wood everywhere, you know, full on construction. Uh, construction is, uh, is not my, my expertise and I've done a little bit growing up you know through my dad and through other things but it's one of those things that I like building so I like building things I built that 3d model of the building it's time to build the real building 
So I'm in there swinging a hammer. I probably could have delegated this, but uh, I'm in there actually helping the, the, the trades do their thing. And uh, I'm all happy until that, that runs out of juice and I can't log my steps because <laughs> uh, the Fitbit is great for quantifying your laziness. So I was really proud that I'm getting all these steps like while I'm building the building and my Fitbit ran out of juice. So I wasn't too happy about that. And then I realized that the project is taking too long when your actual concrete mixer is looking better than the building that you're building because all this stuff is growing up around it. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's been a journey, a, learning, a lot of learning experiences through that. Uh, we should be moving in um, next month sometimes, so everything should be on track right now. So what I learned through that was you have to just dive in. You know, like I've always led by example. I've always been part of the culture, part of the part of the building of the company. Um, I've been the developer. I've been the support person. I've been I've been various trades throughout the organization. I've been a salesperson, etc. Um, so I've always gotten my hands a little dirty in the business, but it's come to actually put your hands and get them dirty and building the building to sell. Um, the team needs me to do that. Um, the team the team wants to have a nice place. I want to be able to had that for them. Um, and so it's very near and dear to me. So the future belongs to those willing to get your hands dirty. If you want to start a business, dive in. Start doing it. You know, like let's stop talking about it. Let's start doing it. Uh, 2020 and forward, I just want to help teach others to build their dreams. Um, you know, it's kind of starting, you're starting to see this like Cloud Academy thing. This is like version one of this, you know, but um, but what we want to be able to do is is help startups form. A lot of people don't know how to do that. They don't know how to start a business. They don't know how to go online, sell online. They don't know how to build something for industry. That's part of what I love about what Paul is doing over at the CICE, um, is they're helping everybody see that come to life. But what happens after that? What happens after you graduate? You know, I want to play a part in that. Um, and so that's where the investing comes from, the investing that I meant earlier. Um, so we'll start seeing more and more of that as we as we go. We need to foster entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, the maker builder mentality. Um, all of that stuff needs fostering, and, and especially in, in in our area. And we can create some amazing things. To do that, you got to organize your dreams. You have to understand what you're wanting to build. Just find a problem, try to solve it, start doing it. Um, how do you actually do that? You have all these ideas. I mentioned the, the rating system earlier. You need a note-taking system to be able to do that. Um, a few productivity hacks just in life in general. Uh, run inbox zero. Don't let all your emails pile up. You've got 700 emails in your <coughs> inbox. You've got a problem. You know, that little sticker there? Um, you're never going to actually be able to prioritize if you're doing that. So run inbox zero. Inbox zero is just a task management system where you actually weed out the stuff that doesn't need to be there, delete it. If you can do it in under two minutes, do it. Do it right then, right now. Right, right now. Um, and then if you are needing to do it on a longer term, you move it to a list. Get it out of your inbox. Move it to a list. Um, you need a place to put the list. Evernote, Simple Note, plenty of other note apps out there. I like Evernote for one thing, and I like Simple, uh, Simple Note for another thing. Simple Note is on all of the computers I'm using it right now to kind of keep me centered a little bit. Um, I use it for all of my just tasks, my, my daily tasks and things. It's on every computer, every device, everything. It's all synced up. Everything's all together. So no matter where I get, it's just like opening Notepad. It's really fast too. That's very important for, that, for this kind of app. Um, and I use Evernote to go paperless. I don't have any paper. You know, I hate paper. Like, let's stop killing trees. You know, let's let's keep it digital. Um, and so Evernote, you can do everything in there. All of my like bills, they're still going to mail you bills, you're still going to get paper in life. What can you do with it to get it out of your house? Uh, scan it with the Fujitsu scanner into Evernote. It's like zoop, 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 zoop. It's super fast, really impactful. Puts it all in Evernote, and then again, it's synced to all of your devices. I can pull up anything anywhere I'm ever at um, and be able to uh, have my document storage for my whole life right there at my fingertips. Um, great productivity hacks. Um, true thoroughness starts with logging, <coughs> um, the ability to kind of build something. You need these kind of skill sets to, to be able to do that. And we're getting close to wrapping up, but the be accountable. Mm. Who, uh, like, who's had a bad lab partner? Anybody? 
Yeah. Uh, right, right. So, one of the, you know, like I was probably the bad lab partner back in the day too. You know, so I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not judging. But uh, as you go into your career, um, you know, you've got to be able to build things, and you've got to be able to uh, be accountable to your teammates. You've got people relying on you. You know, it's not just the grade or the assignment this time. It's like real life. You know, um, and and it's. It's, you know, people's time with their kids. It's people, it's so many important items are coming out of your career and people are needing you on the team. So be accountable. Uh, one, of the, one of my biggest pet peeves is somebody always asking, what do I need to do? You know, like, I'm training you for a reason to understand the business. And what I want you to be able to do is stop asking what you need to do, um, stop being told what to do, basically. Um, and start unlocking your ability to actually see and envision what you need to do to accomplish your goals and your missions for the company. Um, don't shy away from a conversation. It's not like nobody can come and ask me a question. That's fine, you know. But but constant, constant pushing somebody, assigning things to people, uh, micromanaging. I'm sure you all heard of that. Micromanaging is just it's 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 overrated and it, it's difficult to do. It's a bottleneck on your company, on your team, and everybody. So you have to be able to envision what you actually need to do yourselves um, and, and be able to just make sure that that ladders back to the vision and the mission of the company. More than anything, uh, let's stop talking about it. If you've got an idea, let's start doing it. Let's do it. You know? um, you got to start chipping away at it one little piece at a time. So I, uh, I would say be stubborn here as well. Um, be incredibly obstinate in your vision and what you're trying to accomplish, uh, and you'll go far in life. So that uh, that that wraps up the uh, the the journey of AmeriCommerce and, and my journey. <coughs> Uh, I wanted to kind of open it up to some easy questions. Easy, easy. Yeah, yeah. What you got? Why am I easy? Where's it like? Okay, so like how you said earlier that like everybody has ideas, and like sometimes you'll be like, oh, I just thought of that, right? So like your ideas are one of the most important assets for an entrepreneur. How do you deal with sharing your ideas with your teammates when you're trying to develop a team and having that trust to do so for people who are not with it? Right, right. Um, common thing in investment circles is the non-disclosure agreement. You know, like sign this and, and you won't steal my idea, guys. You know, and uh, a lot of investors, this is for me. Uh, they. They, they understand that, but they want to be able to talk and share about ideas because ideas, somebody else is having these ideas. Most likely, somebody else. It's all about the execution, like I mentioned earlier. So, never be scared to share your idea. Uh, as far as how to do it, tactically, you know, I, I, again, keep your notes, put them down, grab a few slides or something, produce just a, a talking point for your uh, organization, like for your idea, and then show it to them. Yeah, that's the way you actually build an idea. You start showing it to people and you start having those conversations. Not just to your mom or your dad. You gotta actually like show it to random people who are not scared to say that your idea sucks, you know. But here's what about this? Like what's this other thing? Like let's rip on your idea a little bit. And that's how greatness is made right there. Um, so yeah, I mean take your idea, don't be afraid to share it, and actually start chipping away at it. Just building that slide deck is one of the things that chip away at your idea. Thank you. 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 Thank you.